Hello everyone and welcome back to the workshop. So, as you could tell by the title, today this is the first in a set of three daggers I'll be doing for this channel. And uh, this first one is going to be the basic dagger. It's basic central ridge, uh, slightly wider cutting dagger. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to knock the corners in on this two inch by quarter inch 1084 stock. And we're actually going to draw this down uh, to about inch by eight millimeter, which is about five sixteenth thereabouts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you could use 3 8 inch thick stock or 10 millimeter thick stock, um, but you want you want about uh, inch by 5 sixteenths to 3 8 um, stock in order to do a decent dagger. The thickness helps with getting that central ridge, uh, and it avoids the issues of over thinning. But uh, the reason I knock those corners in is because we don't want to have too much fish lipping as we draw the stock down in a bar stop. And the blade, the length is up to you. In this case, I'm making a 10 inch bladed cutting dagger. So slightly wider cutting dagger. And the reason I advise when beginning dagger forging to do a wider dagger is because it's much easier to forge the bevels on a wide dagger. The first two daggers in the series will be wider daggers. And that is specifically for that reason. A lot of people who start out in dagger making tend to start too narrow. Uh, now, because we're forging the 2-inch stock down uh, in width, we're actually gaining some thickness. So it's going to go from 6mm to about, like I said, 8mm, between 7 and 8mm uh, in stock size. The important thing to remember about daggers is because they are equal-sided daggers, that you know, like normally when you're talking about a dagger, you're talking about a an even bevel on either side. There are daggers that are one-sided, you know, more than the other. But this is a traditional European-style dagger. One of the things to, that you have to be careful of is making sure that your bar stock is perfectly even in thickness. It can't be thicker on one side than the other because that will actually cause your dagger to come out slightly bent and very misproportioned. You'll notice that I'm t paying close attention to keeping the width even as well as the thickness. And that's because, again, that preform is incredibly important. Now, if this was just cut bar stock that I was using, then it wouldn't be an issue because it comes preformed to be even. But uh, if you're forging out the material like this, if you're forging a Damascus billet or otherwise uh, having to resize the stock, then it's important to make sure that your bar stock is even. Normally I would do this with my forge press, uh, Preston, but in this case I decided to do it by hand to show you the iterative process that it is. It doesn't take too long, but it can be a little arduous. And here you can see I'm moving that stock set down just a little bit further back because I decided I wanted a slightly longer blade and I wanted to utilize as much of the material on the bar as I could. And this, most of this stock that I'm setting down now will end up becoming tang material.
Now, of course, as you're forging out the bar stock, if you are doing this method, you'll notice that it'll mushroom at the edges, and it's really important to dress that out because it will affect the overall profile of your dagger if you don't. So make sure that you're getting the bar to an even width and thickness and getting rid of any of the cupping or mushrooming happening during forging. Well, like I said, this is a fairly iterative process. It's going to take a while to get right, but it pays to take the time to get this stage right because having proper bar stock is incredibly important. And uh, often you'll see people who uh, use non bar stock stock, like square stock or round stock or uh, ball bearings, that kind of thing that don't take the time to preform the bar before they start forging and it causes endless amounts of issues. So take the time, uh, it doesn't take that long, just take that few extra minutes to get the preform of the bar right before you move on to preforming the blade. Here you can see it's about 27 millimeters and about 8 millimeters. So, a tiny bit over an inch and uh, about 5 sixteenths. And now, as usual, we're going to forge a point. It doesn't matter if the point is perfectly central at this point because we can always knock it central as we go. But we want to dress that thickness as we drive the point down. And we're coming in at about a 45 degree angle to the corners before we start driving that point in. But you'll notice there's some crinkling from when this bar was originally cut off. And what I'm going to do in this next heat is I'm actually going to use the edge of the anvil as a hot cut. And I'm going to drive the point over that edge and actually cut that piece off. And so this is a way to get a sharp point with carp's mouth or uh, with other forms of... Uh, lipping, it's an easy way to get a fine point, but you want to make sure you're dressing that thickness because if you have too wide a point when you cut it off, then it will cut again when you try and forge the thickness down. I actually didn't dress it enough in this case and uh, end up with a little bit of wrinkling at the tip, but uh, yeah, it is a useful technique to have in your uh, in your playbook when you need to get rid of some nasty and now we have the tip formed in quite obtuse we're actually going to push that tip back a little bit uh, refine that taper because we want a nice flowing taper now of course this will depend on your uh, desired profile for the, the dagger in the end. Um, I tend to like a more tapered dagger. Uh, in this case it's a cutting dagger so I do want a little bit of thickness, a little bit of width to the blade but I want to make sure that I'm still having a nice sharp point on the end of my dagger. And we've got to remember that it is going to widen out as we forge our bevels. And now here you can see me using my diagonal pin hammer, you could use a straight pin or a cross pin to draw out the length and also provide the distal taper because we're now moving into preform. So we want to taper from the Ricasso, or in this case, it's not going to have a Ricasso, it's going to be a Ricasso list dagger uh, because it's the more simple version of forging a dagger. Uh, we're going to use our pin to 
create a flare but you can see here that it does widen uh, the blade a little bit even with a cross pin or diagonal pin so you do need to dress that width as well because you want it to taper in both directions you want to taper it distally and you want to taper in width along the entire length of the blade if it does flare out you can make a leaf shaped blade that way but uh, in this case we're trying to create more of a traditional uh, either parallel sided or slightly tapering dagger so make sure you're staying on top of that uh, here I'm also using the edge of the hammer to create a fullering kind of system so that I can draw out more of that distal taper and again you want to make sure that the uh, width is even across or the thickness is even across the width of the bar if you're uh, not making sure of that it is going to end up being a misshapen dagger So now that I have a nice, neat and even preform, we're going to use the edge of the anvil and the edge of the hammer to cut in our tang shoulders. We don't need to cut them in very deeply, as I have said in previous uh, forging demonstrations, including the sax and in the hidden tang knife videos, you do not have to cut deep shoulders when you're forging them. It's actually better if you don't. So we're just creating a delineation between where the blade bevels are going to finish and the tang is going to start. In this case, the blade bevels will go through into the tang, but we're not actually going to bevel the tang entirely. We could, but we'll end up uh, with grinding those anyway. And this is your last chance to make sure that your preform is entirely perfect. It's nice and clean, nice and uh, neat. And that's going to make it easier. Now, I did move over to the press uh, because I was running out of time in the day when I was filming this. Uh, but you could do this with a hammer, just draw out that tang a little bit. You don't want to draw it out to its full length at this stage because you don't want a weak uh, point between the handle and the blade. But it does help to uh, draw it out as much as possible while it's still on the bar. And uh, doing it with a press makes it a lot faster. You could do it with a guillotine tool or a spring swage um, or a spring fuller. Uh, it will make it just as easy, but yeah, I just had the press and uh, I was in a rush, so this is what you get. <laughs> Okay, so moving into beveling, and we're going to be starting from the tip. Uh, now, as you'll know, I tend to start from the plunge cut on uh, ricassoed blades, whether that be ricassoed daggers, ricassoed hunting knives, buoys. But if they do not have a ricasso, I will normally start from the tip or the end of the tang. Uh, I'll start at one end and work all the way to the other end. So in this case, because we're not actually beveling into the tang, I'm going to be starting from the tip and pushing downwards. And you'll notice here that in the narrow section at the tip, I will be creating a medial ridge, that middle ridge. And uh, that is because obviously you don't have the width not to. So you want to make sure that you're using a very steep angle, uh, both with your hammer and on the anvil, to try and not cross that center section. Try and be as short with your bevels as you can because the further you cross the center line, the thinner the dagger gets. So work at the edge and only at the edge. This is where uh, the push technique rather than the pinch technique of forging uh, really comes into its own because you want to push those bevels back in rather than trying to draw them out uh, in such narrow stock. And you can see there the nice medial ridge between the two bevels. And then basically like any other blade, we're going to just start working our way down the blade section by section, normally four inch sections at a time, 
overlapping into the last bevel. And we're only going to work one side at a time. So we're going to work one edge of the dagger, and we're going to work it both sides, uh, flipping back and forth to make sure that we don't start corkscrewing, because that is something that quite commonly happens, especially in double bevel blades. And as we move back into the meat of the dagger, as we are here, we want to try and make it so that the flat portion of the bar stays intact, right? We don't want to create a medial ridge while forging because we want to keep that distal taper even. And in this case, we're forging with the intent of grinding this dagger. Uh, one of the future daggers I'll be doing will be forge to finish, but in this case, because we'll be grinding this dagger afterwards, if we keep a little bit of a flat section, it doesn't have to be very thick, but the if we keep a little bit of the flat section, that means that our distal taper will stay perfectly even and we won't lose any height or any thickness in the dagger blade. The worst thing that can happen now is that you accidentally hit the central ridge, because if you do that, you're going to end up with a dip in the blade that will be impossible to uh, fix. So at this stage, aiming at those edges, pushing those edges back in, uh, and making sure that we're avoiding any blows near the center of the blade. And uh, again, I'm leaving that flat section. And I'm, I'm trying to work relatively roughly at this stage. I'm working very, very thick bevels, and I'm working down the blade a lot faster than I normally would because I'm not trying to take them to final thickness at this stage. We want to rough everything in and then come back and true it up, and that means that we have the opportunity to lift those bevels a little bit into the center if we need to, just to avoid trying to damage that central ridge. And you'll notice that as I'm forging, I'm forging one bevel, so the blade is bending in one direction. And then as I'm forging the opposite bevel uh, in that same location, it's bending it back straight. That won't always happen, especially if you're using the push technique of uh, forging bevels. You'll notice as the hammer strikes, it's actually pushing the blade away from the hammer. And that action, as you work down the blade, the further away you get from the tip, the tip will actually try and whip backwards around at you because it wants to stay where it is and the hammer is pushing that blade material away. So the blade, the blade will actually start bending towards the hammer rather than away, which is what you're used to with forging uh, single bevel blades. And here we've got a different angle on the, uh, on the blade to show you the angle I'm holding it at on the bevel. Now unfortunately it was impossible to get the thing completely aligned so it looks here when I'm doing the far side it looks like I'm holding it flat but I'm actually holding it at the same angle I was when I was holding it in the forehand blows. And here you can see it there. But uh, you can see that the bevels are quite still thick there and I'm not working into that central portion of the blade so that I'm avoiding damaging my distal taper. But I'm trying to get the blade bevels to be even width and even height, right? So the blade bevel edge is going to be the same thickness on both sides, and the height of the blade bevel from edge to the ridge is going to be the same height on both sides, and that means that our dagger is going to be completely even along the entire length of the blade. Again, at that same angle, just showing you that how I'm angling the hammer, how I'm angling the material to the anvil. And again, I'm working from the corner of the billet, the corner of the bar, back in towards the bar, rather than trying to work up the bar and then draw that material out towards the edge. I'm not trying to gain as much width here as I would if I was forging, say, a bowie knife. Uh, in which I would, case I would use that pinching technique like I've shown in four, previous videos in this series uh, that gain, gains us a lot more width. We are gaining some width as a nature of forging bevels will do, but we're actually trying to push that material back in order to avoid uh, kind of damaging that central ridge and keeping our hammer a little too flat. We're going to just keep working down, and again, we only need to work a hammer face width at a time. We don't really need to work four to six inches of blade. There are some smiths out there who will tell you that you need to bevel your blades with, you know, within four heats or that thereabouts. It's complete malarkey. You can forge your blade in as many heats as it takes you. Take your time, get it right, 
so that you don't have to go back to square one and start again because you made a mistake trying to rush. Take your time, get nice clean forgings, and again, accuracy is incredibly important, especially when forging daggers. <clears throat> you want to make sure that your blows are accurate and not powerful. Power comes after accuracy in the case of daggers. We don't need a lot of power to bevel a blade, we do need a lot of accuracy. So, we're aiming to hit those bevels perfectly, we're trying to keep them straight. If our blade is sliding around the anvil, we want to make sure that it's correcting back to where we're comfortable before we strike it. And if that means it takes several more heats than it needed to, then it didn't take more several more heats than it needed to, it took him exactly as many heats as it needed. Now, like I said, this blade will not have a Rakaso, so these bevels are going to move straight through those shoulders. And they're actually going to cause the shoulders to widen out a little bit, which means that we're deeper set than it looks uh, as far as the shoulders go for the Tang. But in the event that you were making a Rakaso, it would be an entirely different process. And um, that will be a future video. If you're interested, make sure to hit that subscribe button and make sure to hit the bell notification button to be notified when I upload new videos. I'm doing multiple blades in this series, and if you have a recommendation for one that you would like to see, please leave it in the comment section down below. So again, beveling through their shoulders beveling into the tang. Now I could carry this on and bevel the tang completely, but that would have to be after I've finished drawing out the tang. In this case the tang is only roughed in uh, to give us a delineation between blade stock and tang stock, uh, so I don't really need to carry the bevels past the shoulders, and in the end I decided not to anyway because I can always grind those bevels in later. But again we want to be really careful, just working it slowly, making sure that we're not touching that center line, making sure that we're maintaining that distal taper, maintaining that thickness. And uh, of course it's thickest here at the shoulders, so we're actually going to get more width out of beveling than we would uh, if we were beveling the same thickness as the tip. So your blade is going to naturally taper width-wise if it tapers distally. And you'll see there that I turned the blade sideways to try and straighten it out a bit, and that's because as you're forging those bevels, as I said before, the blade is trying to whip back towards the hammer. Uh, and that can't really be corrected by more beveling because you don't want to thin it out too much. And here I'm going to be correcting again to straighten it out. There's nothing wrong with doing that, and it's really good to do it while the edge is still thick when these bevels are only roughed in because you're not going to be doing the heavy blows anymore, which means that you're no longer going to be creating that whip effect with the blade. Uh, and this is especially true on all narrow, narrow blades. So um, now I'm going to go back and I'm going to dress my bevels at a lower heat uh, now that the blade is straight. You could use a wooden bat uh, or a, you know, a baton like I've used in previous videos uh, to straighten it, but Given that the bevels are thick enough, I can do it with a hammer and I'm not worried about creating dings in the edge. And here you can see, we've still got that nice flat spot and it's about even thickness all the way down the blade until it gets close to the tip. And that means that the distal taper that I forged into the preform is immediately going to be the same as when it was preformed. So here I'm cutting the dagger off the bar because we're gonna forge that tang out before we finally finish forge and planish the surface.
So there's nothing really special to drawing out the pang of this blade. It's much like drawing out any other kind of material. You're just going to forge it repeatedly using fullers or the flat face of your hammer if you want it to take longer. Uh, to draw out a simple taper. The one main important feature is to keep the bevels off the anvil. You don't want to accidentally walk those bevels onto the anvil, especially when you're forging on the sides, uh, because then you'll bend the tang and you'll also damage your uh, bevels. So yeah, make sure you keep that off the anvil. And you can see here that I'm using the diagonal pin again to draw out the length just makes it a little bit faster. Um, it's pretty iterative. I would normally do this using the press, but I figured I would show how it can be done by hand relatively easily, a couple of heats. I'm also not deepening the shoulders at this stage uh, because the shoulders are as deep as they need to be. Uh, you do not need to deepen the shoulders any more than they are. Uh, the only reason I'm forging anywhere near the shoulders is to just make sure that the taper is going from the shoulders down to the tip of the tang. But otherwise, I don't need to worry about making those shoulders any deeper than I already set them in. So the other thing that I'm making sure not to do is to not walk that taper up onto the blade because if we accidentally back taper before the shoulders then the shoulders will actually taper backwards into the guard which means that we'll end up with this weird thickness just in front of the shoulders that won't look very good when it comes to a guard fit up. So make sure that you're keeping those shoulders off the anvil in all cases and not hammering on them at all. The thickest point of the dagger should be right at the tang shoulders. So it should taper from the tang shoulders to the end of the tang and from the tang shoulders all the way to the tip. So now that we have the tang tapered and uh, all of that established, we can now go back in and clean everything up. Like I said, you rough everything in and then you come back, clean it up later. And I'm using much lighter blows. I don't need it as hot because I'm not trying to forge really at this point. I'm trying to planish. I'm going to dress everything up so that the bevels are of even height and even thickness on both sides of the dagger. I might take time to dress any bends or twisting uh, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But uh, yeah, we're just going to make sure that everything is finally established, ready for the grinder. Because we're grinding, we want to leave the edge a little thicker than if we were doing this forge to finish. The edge, uh, as it comes out from the hammer, is about 2 millimeters, uh, 2.5 millimeters thick, which is about a sixteenth of an inch, a little bit more than a sixteenth.
Now here when working the tip, uh, we, want, we want to make sure that we're not hammering into that ridge because now we've created a medial ridge. We don't want to hammer into it because we're going to be damaging the thickness of the blade. But that being said, we do want those bevels to be evenly wide. Uh, one of the issues that you'll run into is that the angle between the anvil and your piece and the hammer in your piece may not be the same. And so it's important to uh, make sure that your angles are all right. Now, if it's bent, we can just hammer, you know, straight across one side and the other side and get it straight again. But if it's twisted, we need to treat it much like with the, uh, the single bevels. We need to hammer at an angle. But, of course, we have two bevels, so we can't hammer straight across. So what we need to do, again, find that line, hammer one side, flip to the second bevel, hammer the other. Right, so if we're hammering the bevels, we need to make sure that we're angling to that bevel. Same thing goes if it's twisting to the left. We want to draw a line where it's between the bend and we're going to hammer one side and then flip to the other bevel, hammer the other side. And that's going to help us dress out that twist. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, as you can see, here is the final piece. You've got that flat in the middle that shows our distal taper. It tapers in both directions and everything is nice and even. If you enjoyed this content, I would suggest hitting the subscribe button and make sure to hit that notification icon to be notified of when I upload new videos because I have many more of these how to forge videos planned and uh, there is a lot more content to come. That content is made possible by these wonderful people you can see on the screen right now, my patrons, with my top patron being Jared Russell. I absolutely adore these people and they make this kind of content possible and make my life so much easier and uh, I can't do anything without them. So if you want to join my Patreon, the link will be down in the description below. But if you want to support the channel without monetary, monetary gain, then please hit that like button and uh, share it with your friends maybe. With that being said, I hope you have a fantastic day. I will see you next time. Have a good one.